This morning we begin our study into the book of Exodus for almost half of last year we spent studying the book of Genesis, um, learning the characters of Genesis, and we've learned many, many things about their lives. We learned um, the story of Adam and Eve and how God created them and the fall and how they messed up. We learned about their children, Cain and Abel, and um, how murder began in a family right after a worship service. We learned about God's judgment in the story of Noah. And from there, we spent um, quite a bit of time studying the family of Abraham, learning about Abraham and his son Isaac and his grandson Jacob. And then the last six, six, seven weeks, um, studying the life of Joseph and what Joseph's story teaches us. And when we left off last week, Joseph had died. And before he died, he told his brothers that he wanted them to take his bones back to the promised land when God delivered the people. And so this morning, we dive into the book of Exodus. Exodus is an epic tale of fire, of wind, of sand, of water. It's all in there. It's a story that's made for the big screen. The scenes themselves take place um, in the hot desert sun and the background is the great pyramids of Egypt. It's in the background. Almost every scene in this book is a masterpiece. There's the baby that's in the basket and how God miraculously brings this baby to the daughter of Pharaoh and that baby ends up growing up to become the deliverer of the people of Israel. There is the burning bush there. God encounters Moses. There's the river that turns into blood. There's the angel of death. There's the parting of the Red Sea and the Israelites walking through dry land. And then that same Red Sea destroying an entire army when it comes back down. There is um, there's the giving of the Ten Commandments. There's so many dramatic stories in the book of Exodus. See, when you hear this story, when it When you read this story, it's stories that we'll never forget. Even Hollywood has taken time to study this story and present it on the big film, on the big screen. There was a silent picture in 1923, the Ten Commandments in 1956 with Charlton Heston. There was the Prince of Egypt in 1998. And even just two years ago, Exodus, um, Gods and Kings, was all presented just on the story of Exodus. Exodus is the second of five books that Moses wrote, what we call the Torah or the Pentateuch. It is written around the 15th century B.C., so it's a very, very old story that deserves our attention this morning. My prayer is that when we study this book, we will encounter who God is. That's my prayer. Um, Because this story is more than just about Moses. It's more than just about the plagues. And it's more than just about a Red Sea parting into two. And it's more than just about the Ten Commandments. This is a story that speaks about the wonders of our God. So my hope and my prayer is that as you are here and as we go through this book, that you would see who God is and what God has done. And if we sit patiently... And read God's story, my prayer is that we will find ourselves in God's story and we will allow God's story to rewrite our own story. And in doing so, that we would be swept up into something so great that is so much bigger than us and our little lives and our little problems. That we would be swept into the greatness of God. So today we're going to open up in the book of Exodus chapter 1 and I hope that what you will see in this passage is that we serve an unchanging God. An unchanging God. He is what we call in theology immutable, which means that what God does in time, He planned for eternity. And all that He planned in eternity, He will carry out in time. And what He has committed to in His Word, He will be faithful to do it. That means that there is nothing that God has said about Himself and what he will do that he will rescind on, that will be modified, because God doesn't change. See, throughout scriptures, you find 
scriptures and authors calling God, God is a rock. And the reason that he's called a rock is he could be considered um, in an ocean that the winds are constantly changing, it, the waves are constantly changing and moving. God is the immovable rock at the bottom of the ocean floor, even when the rolls and the, um, the tides move along. So when God makes a promise, he keeps it despite what we may do or not do. And even if you and I are inconsistent in our walk and in a constant flux or and fickle, God is consistent. He is stable. He is reliable. He doesn't change. He is a covenant-keeping God. He won't renege on his promises. He won't go back on his word. He will not change his mind. You find this throughout scriptures. Let me just highlight just a few passages. Psalms 110 says this, The Lord has sworn he will not change his mind. Psalm 102 says this, They will perish, but you will remain. They will wear out like a garment. You will change them like a robe. They will pass away, but you, O oh God, are the same. And your ears have no end. Numbers says, God is not a man that he should lie, or the son of man that he should change his mind. Has he said it? Will he not do it? Has he spoken? Will he not fulfill it? Book of Malachi chapter 3 says, chapter 3, verse 6 says, For I, the Lord, do not change. Therefore, you, O children of Jacob, you are not consumed. Why? Because I don't change. See, in the book of Exodus, Israel was God's people. When Moses goes and stands before Pharaoh, do you remember what he says? He says, God said, let my people go. They were the people of God. Hundreds of years earlier, God spoke to Abraham and made a covenant with their great-great-grandfather, Abraham. The covenant that he made with Abraham was unconditional. See, a covenant isn't like a contract at all. A contract can be broken if either side fails to keep up to their end of the bargain. We're dealing with a bunch of hail damage at our house from the storms a couple weeks ago, and we took our car into the shop, and we've signed a contract with them. The contract says you fix our car, and when you fix our car, we will give you a check, right? If they don't keep their end of the bargain, the contract can be broken. If they don't prompt finish on what they promised they said they would do, we're not giving them a check. It's a contract. Both sides have to keep their end of the bargain. If one side fails, the contract can be broken. But a covenant isn't like that at all. Back in the day, back in the Old Testament, to make a covenant with someone, you didn't sign your name on a piece of paper, you didn't shake a hand, or you didn't even give your word. The way that they would make a covenant in the Old Testament, they would take an animal, they would cut that animal in two, and they would put one side of the animal on this side, and one side of the animal on this side, and then both parties of the covenant will walk in between the animal, and basically the picture was saying, may it be to me like these two animals, like this animal, if I don't keep my promise, if I don't do what I say. So in Genesis 15, God makes a covenant with Abraham. And in that story, we find Abraham cutting the animal in two and placing it on two sides of the road. And then he's just sitting there swatting off flies, waiting for God to show up. And while he's waiting, God puts Abraham into this deep sleep. And Abraham falls asleep. And the only one that passes through the two animals, the, the both sides of the animals, is God. Abraham never walks through it, signifying that the covenant was completely on God. He alone will fulfill his promise despite what Abraham and his family may or may not do. See, the covenant was one of grace. It would be all on God to keep that promise. What was the promise that God made to Abraham? The promise was that 
out of Abraham, he would make Abraham a great nation and give them a land of their own and that they would be a missionary force to proclaim the gospel to the ends of the earth. That's the promise that God made to Abraham and his descendants. But we get to Exodus 1 and there's a small problem. There's death, there's suffering, there's persecution. And all three of those things were threatening to kill God's promises. And the people were no doubt wondering if God would be true to his word and be the unchanging God that he said he would be. See, but what we will discover in our story this morning is that God will do what he promised to do. And neither death nor suffering nor persecution will stop him from fulfilling his promises. See, maybe this morning you feel like the Israelites in this chapter, unsure of what God is doing in your life, lacking confidence on whether God will come through in your life or not, wondering if maybe he did change his mind about you. But as we look at this chapter this morning, we will see that even though God isn't mentioned till the very end of the chapter, we see his hand at work fulfilling his promises even when death and suffering and persecution threaten the people of God. Those are my three points. Death, suffering, persecution. Point one is God is unchanging in death. If you have your Bibles, Exodus 1, verse 1 through verses 5 says this. These are the names of the sons of Israel who came to Egypt with Jacob, each with his own household, Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Issachar, Sublin, Benjamin, Dan, Naphtali, Gad, and Asher. All the descendants of Jacob were 70 persons. Joseph was already in Egypt. In some of your Bibles, it, it says, and, it begins with the word and. The one thing your English teacher tells you not to do, right? Begin with the word and. You know, in the Bible, God actually does that in 14 different books. So if it's okay with God, it's okay with us, right? And so um, God says, and these are the names of the sons of Israel. So this is a continuation of what happened in Genesis. A couple weeks ago, we were talking about the promise that God made to Jacob before Jacob goes to Egypt in Genesis 46. And God shows up to Jacob in a vision. He says, Jacob, here I am. I am God, the God of your father. Don't be afraid to go down to Egypt, for there I will make you a great nation. I myself will go with you to Egypt, and I will also bring you up again, and Joseph's hand shall close your eyes. See, Jacob and his, sibling, and Jacob and his sons and their daughters and their grandchildren believed that they were in Egypt by divine command. They were there because God wanted them there under divine promise awaiting divine intervention. They no doubt believed Joseph was going to lead them as a nation. Joseph, remember, was second in command of all of Egypt. He was like the vice pharaoh. And even though his brothers tried to kill him, and even though they tried to sell him into slavery, God actually takes all of that evil and uses it for good, not only for Joseph, but for his family and for everyone around him. A famine hits, and Joseph with insight from God, stores up enough food to keep his family from starving to death, and they all move to Egypt. And they are there in Egypt thinking, this is where God is going to fulfill his promises. This is where God is going to send the Messiah, and they will be a nation that God has promised. Joseph was their refuge and their strength. They depended on Joseph to be the one who would take care of them. So here they are in Egypt, all the family members, and life is good. Pharaoh treats them good. They are growing. They're multiplying. Your brother is the king's most trusted man. But then something terrible happens. Verse 6 says, Joseph died, and all of his brothers, and all that generation. Wait a minute. What happened to the promise of a nation? Wasn't Joseph the man that was supposed to lead them? And it wasn't just Joseph that died. His brothers die, his father dies, his entire generation dies with e in Egypt, and all his children and grandchildren are left with the stories that they have to cling on to. No experiences, no encounters with God. 
They're left with stories of how God used to speak to their grandfather and great-grandfathers, but they haven't encountered God at all. What are they going to do now? Scripture doesn't talk about the sons of Joseph taking command and lead and taking care of the people. There's no distinct leader among the people of God. There's no one to lead them. There are people without a leader, with no vision, stuck in a land that doesn't belong to them. Are the promises gone? Is God done with them? Will death be an end to this nation? See, the first thing our text teaches us this morning is that even if we all die, God's promises do not. Even if you and I are gone off the face of the planet, God doesn't change. God's promises isn't dependent on you and I being part of the scene and being part of the story. None of us in this room are irreplaceable. See, you may lose your house, your possessions may go down in flames, you may lose a friend or family member to death, you might even lose your job, you might lose everything, but the one thing you cannot lose is God. He is always with you. He will never fail you. He never dies. He never fades. And he never fails in your life. He is going to keep his promises even in the face of death. Verse 7 says, But the people of Israel were fruitful, and they increased greatly. They multiplied and grew exceedingly strong so that the land was filled with them. They increased, just like God promised, even though they had no leader. Even when they were in a foreign land, and even when they saw no human to lead them forward to the promises of God. They go from a people of 70 walking into Egypt, to now there's about 600,000 men alone in just a few hundred years. The promise that God gave Abraham that his descendants would flourish came true. Verse 7 literally reads, as for the Israelites, they grew, they were fruitful, they swarmed, they increased, they got more and more powerful, and the land was filled with them. Five different words to explain how this population just exploded in the land. Notice, not only did they grow in number, but they grew exceedingly strong as a people. They were becoming a community a church, if you will, without a lead guy. God was their lead guy. They were becoming so many of them that they filled the land. And everywhere the Egyptians turned, there were more and more Israelites. They were breeding like rabbits. They were just exploding all over the place. You know what that teaches me? That Jesus is the head of the church. Not me. Not any of the other elders of this church, not any of the people that are on this stage. And this goes for any church. It's not about who's leading it, that Jesus is the head. God can and will raise up people to fulfill his promises despite who might be in charge. Again, none of us in this room are irreplaceable. The Josephs of this world may die, but God is still true to his promises. Jesus said in Matthew, Chapter 16, I will build my church. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. God is unchanging in death. That's the first thing we see in our story. But the second thing we see in our story is that God is unchanging in suffering. Look at verse 8 with me. And now there arose a new king in Egypt. This king did not know Joseph. And he said to his people, Behold, the people of Israel are too many and too mighty for us. Come, let us deal shrewdly with them, lest they multiply. And if war breaks out, they join our enemies and fight against us and escape from our land. All of a sudden, the situation becomes incredibly hard for the people of God. They have no leader in place, and now the government turns on them. This new king does not remember Pharaoh, meaning he refuses to acknowledge all the good that Joseph has done for them. He refuses to acknowledge that Joseph 
help them in such a hard time. All the fathers of the tribes have died, and the Israelites are suddenly in danger because the king has decided to incite his own people against God's people by using propaganda. He says, they may fight against us. They may join our enemies and attack us. But the nation of Israel weren't warriors. They were shepherds. See, regardless, the king looked out on the people of God, and they, he got a little afraid. And so, just like most dictators using being insecure and paranoid, he begins to play the race card, and he silences them. He devises a plan to make their life hard, lest they would think about rebelling against them. Verse 11 says, they set taskmasters over them to afflict them with heavy burdens. They built for Pharaoh's cities, Pitom and Ramses. The word afflict there literally means to bring low, to beat them down. But you know, God actually promised, God actually warned Abraham that this would happen in Genesis 15. God spoke to Abraham in Genesis 15, and here's what he said. He said, know for certain that your offspring will be foreigners in a land that is not theirs and will be servants there. And they will be afflicted there for 400 years. But I will bring judgment on the nation that they serve, and afterward they shall come out with great possessions. This was all in God's plan. But the people of God had a hard time seeing through the suffering to the promises of God. Satan was using this to blind them to the promises while God was using this to show them the promises. You can bet that in any given trial in our lives, Satan will want to use it to destroy us. But God will use any trial in our life to save us and to grow us. The very experiences that threaten to drive you the furthest away from God are the exact experiences that bring you into the closest possible fellowship with Jesus. Verse 13 says this, So they ruthlessly made the people of Israel work as slaves and made their lives bitter with hard service in mortar and brick and in all kinds of work in the field. And in all their work, they ruthlessly made them work as slaves. Notice the words that they use to describe the slavery here. Life was bitter, hard service, all kinds of work, hard work, ruthlessly worked, followed by made them work as slaves. The people of Israel were organized into like work gangs. They become anonymous masses, depersonalized, losing all individuality in the eyes of their oppressors. Some were forced to work in the fields where the toil was exhausting and the results were small despite high expectations from the Egyptians and harsh punishment when the crops wouldn't grow. Others were put into all stages of brick making, whether it's hauling water or pouring clay or cutting bricks or hauling stacks of brick, brick to a work site or then laying them down with mortar. They were forced to work hard. And it wasn't like they were building a place for themselves. The two structures that are mentioned in this verse, one was for an Egyptian god, and the other was for a royal residence for Pharaoh. It was like adding insult to injury. They were daily suffering as far as their eye could see, as far as their memory could recall, and as far into the future as their mind could imagine. How hard it must have been for them to see how their experiences at this moment fit into God's greater story. I'm sure many times they wondered if there was even a story at all to be told. You've been there, right? From the vantage point of the ground level where under the fog where you can't see anything promising at all where all it looks like it's pain and suffering and hardship, where it seems like God is absent, he's silent, and it makes you angry, it makes you wonder if he cares. 
The most active character in Exodus 1 is Pharaoh. God's silent through most of it. See, we can read Exodus 1 and we have the advantage of seeing the big picture. But the people of Israel, when they were going through it, they didn't. They had no idea when freedom was going to happen. They had no idea if they were ever going to be delivered. They had no idea if they would die in Egypt. We know that even though God seemed absent from the people, that he really wasn't. We know that even though Pharaoh seemed to have the final say in determining the fate of the people of Israel, he really didn't. We know that. But the people of Israel didn't know that when they were going through it. How hard it is for us to remember that when we're going through our own trials and our own hardships in life that we don't see the big picture because we're so caught up in what's happening right in front of us. I'm going to ask you the question, what was Pharaoh trying to accomplish with all of this slavery and with all of this racism? You know what he was trying to do? He was trying to kill off the people of God. And unknowingly, he was opposing the promises that God made to this people that he would make them into a great nation. In putting them through incredible hardship, Pharaoh thought that the people wouldn't want to have children born into this environment. And by taking away time from being at home with their family, he thought that would lead to broken homes, rebellious children. He still works the exact same way today, doesn't he? Pharaoh was basically attacking the family unit to destroy the very fabric of the people of God. This is the way Satan always works. He's consistently attacking families. But notice what verse 12 says. The more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied, and the more they spread abroad. And the Egyptians were in dread of the people of Israel. Here they they are suffering. Here's Pharaoh coming up with plans to basically encourage them not to have any more kids. And here is God in the midst of that, continuing to bless the people of God. God continues to keep his covenant, and he keeps pursuing the people of God, even in the midst of hardship and suffering. He didn't change even though their circumstances changed. God never stopped working. Can I encourage you this morning? God is still working in your life. He's moving. He's active. It might seem like Pharaoh is the only one speaking, but behind the scenes is a good God who is faithful and true to his covenant promise to you. Don't give up. Don't quit. He is still working in your life. See, if you know anything about church history and how we got here today, You'll know that in church history, the church, early church, exploded because the plagues, around the times that the plagues wiped out a third of the known world at that time. When the plagues hit Eastern Europe, unbelievers left town. They boarded themselves in and kicked sick and dying people to the side and to the streets. But historians say that Christians didn't do that. They faced the same plagues that everyone else faced, but they trusted God in the midst of it. Here's what, they, here's what was said about the church in the midst of the plagues. Historians say that most of the Christians show unbounding love and ro- loyalty. They never sparing themselves and thinking only of themselves. Heedless of danger, they took charge of the sick attended to their need, and ministered to them in Christ, and with them departed this life serenely happy. They were infected by others with the disease, drawing on themselves the sickness of their neighbors, and yet cheerfully accepted their pains. Many, in nursing and curing others, transferred their death 
to themselves and died in the place of other people. Rodney Stark is a sociologist who wrote a book called The Rise of Christianity, and this is what he says about Christianity. He says, the cities that were filled with homeless and impoverished, Christianity offered charity as well as hope. To cities filled with newcomers and strangers, Christianity offered an immediate basis for attachment. To cities filled with orphans and widows, Christianity provided a new and expanded sense of family. To cities torn by ethnic strife, Christianity offered a new basis for solidarity. And to cities that faced epidemics and fires and earthquakes, Christianity offered effective nursing services. God is unchanging in death. God is unchanging in suffering. Point number three, God is unchanging in persecution. Verse 15 says, Then the king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, one of whom was named Shephara and the other Pua, when you serve as a midwife to the Hebrew woman and see them on the birth stool, if it is a son, you shall kill him. But if it's a daughter, she shall live. See, though the people of God would eventually be delivered from slavery, things would get a lot worse before it got better for them. Much worse. Pharaoh turned from slavery to slaughter from imprisonment to infanticide, since they couldn't stop having babies, Pharaoh began to have the children killed. So he goes to these two midwives who were nurses that delivered the babies and told them, let the daughters live, let the sons die. He targeted the boys because he felt that if the boys grew up, they would fight against the nation of Egypt. Make no mistake, hiding behind the shadows of Pharaoh was Satan himself. He knew that the promised Messiah would come from this people group. And he knew that that promised Messiah would be a male. And if he could kill off the nation, then the promise wouldn't come true. This was an all-out war between God and Satan. These midwives, these women dedicated their entire lives. They went to midwifing school and trained so that they could help moms and babies survive desperate deliveries. No doubt, over the years, they comforted many women upon the dirt, death of their newborn son. And now Pharaoh calls them and says, kill the sons. Notice what verse 17 says. The midwives feared God and did not do as the king of Egypt commanded them, but let the male children live. Amazing. These two women have been commanded by Pharaoh. Pharaoh who can basically say, hey, you're dead, and they are dead in an instant. These two women have been commanded by Pharaoh, kill the sons, and they literally rebel against the culture. Despite threats, despite possible death, they feared God more than they feared man. These two women are incredibly great women. And isn't it interesting that when you read Exodus 1, that God would take time to mention the name of these two women, but he doesn't mention who this Pharaoh is at all. Pharaoh is just a title for the king. He takes the time to mention two ordinary women who was obedient and faithful. But he doesn't mention who's in charge. You know what that tells me? It doesn't matter what your title is. It doesn't matter what your position is. It doesn't matter what you do. All that matters is whether you are being obedient to Jesus or not. Because if you're being obedient to Jesus, it doesn't matter if everyone else recognizes you. One day you'll hear those words, well done, good and faithful servant. It doesn't matter what people think of you, their opinions of you. There's only one opinion that matters. And if you are being faithful there, I guarantee you, 
he will recognize it. He'll notice it. And watch what happens. Verse 18. The king of Egypt called the midwives and said to them, Why have you done this? Why have you let the male children live? The midwives said to them, Because the Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women. They are vigorous. And they give birth before the midwife comes to them. They lie. They basically go to Pharaoh and lie to them. He says, these women, before we all even show up, these babies just pop out. We don't even do work. We just we get there and the work is already done. We're midwifing, but we're not actually doing any work. We could be sitting on Facebook all day because it's just, they're just coming out. And in somehow or another, Pharaoh believes this. The guy has a few loose screws. And he accepts their reasoning and he lets them go. Notice what verse 20 says. God dwelt well with the midwives. And the people multiplied and grew very strong. And because the midwives feared God, he gave them families. Basically, he gave them a heritage a legacy. He made sure their name continued on and on and on. When you obey God, he'll take care of you. He will provide for you. He will bless you. It might not be the way that you want your blessing, but it will be in the way that God knows is good for you. Be obedient. God honors them. He honored their risk-taking faith in him. And he continued to be the unchanging one when he came to his promises. He was building a nation despite incredible persecution by an evil dictator. You know, God used persecution and suffering throughout history to purify the church. Many parts of the world today where the church is thriving and growing, it's places where The doors for the gospel have been closed. And yet in those places, it is spreading like wildfire. People are getting saved left and right. God works when, humanly speaking, it seems impossible. When it seems like people stand against God, that's where God shines the brightest. Look at the early church in Acts. All of a sudden, the church began to get persecuted They begin to run all over the place, and everywhere they rent, churches start getting established. God works in the midst of hardship and pain. Let me conclude. You and I, we serve an unchanging God. He doesn't change. He doesn't change based on how you feel today. He doesn't change based on your circumstances or your situations. He does not change. When you gave your life to him and he said he will be your God, he will hold you in the palm of your hands, he will watch over you, protect you, and provide for you, he does not change based on what you're going through today. He is faithful. He is good. He, you might be going through hardships and difficulties, but know that you are exactly where God wants you to be. And in the midst of that, he will purify you, refine you, and make you into what he has called you to be. Trust him in the middle of the process. You know, these things that the people of God went through in Exodus 1 were the exact same things that Jesus went through. When he came to this earth and died a horrible death so that we can experience salvation. Jesus was ridiculed. He was despised by men. His own family at times thought that he was crazy. Even on the night of his betrayal, he arose to a legion. Many, many soldiers come to arrest this one man. And they bind him and they take him to Jerusalem. And yet when Peter tries to attack this one little guy against all these soldiers, cuts one guy's ear off, Jesus takes that man's ear, puts it back, heals him, and then willingly submits himself to go to death row and go to the cross. Do you know Jesus spent most of his life suffering? The prophet Isaiah says that he was known as a man of sorrows, 
full of grief. When he was taken to be flogged, he willingly gave his back to be beaten and willingly gave his hands and his feet to be pierced. He was like a lamb before the slaughter. And yet he was silent. And when he was reviled, he did not revile back, but entrusted himself to the father whom he knew would take care of him. And all through his life, people tried to kill him. Even at his birth, Herod, just like Pharaoh, had all the baby boys in Bethlehem killed to try and stop God's plan. And when he was about to die on the cross, Jesus doesn't yell out condemnation and cursing like the thieves did that were next to him. Instead, Jesus' words were, Father, forgive them, because they don't know what they're doing. And then he turns and he says, Father, I commit my spirit to you. I trust you. He never, never, never changed his mind. He was resolved knowing that through persecution came the promise, that knowing that through suffering came salvation, and knowing through death came the death of all sin, all hell, and ultimately Satan himself. God didn't let Jesus down. Three days later, Jesus rose from the dead, and today he lives. And the same God is working in and on and through you this morning. So if you're discouraged this morning, hold on. If you're suffering, hold on. If you're unsure of your future, hold on. If life has been hard and you're not getting answers, hold on. The same God that was working behind the scenes for the Israelites when the Egyptians were enslaving them and persecuting them and killing them is the same God that is working behind the scenes in your life and my life this morning. Be patient. Trust him. One day you will see it was worth it. He is absolutely faithful. How do I know? This table reminds me every week that he is faithful. That when I was dead to sins, he didn't give me a bunch of rules and say, live by these rules and then somehow you'll make it. When I was dead to sins, he came and he suffered and he was persecuted and he died in my place. So that this morning when I sit here, I know that I can call him Father and he hears my voice. This morning when you come to the communion table, you come not because of how good you were or how well you performed this week. You become because there is a God who loved you and died for you. To him we give all glory, praise, and worship. This morning I'm going to invite you to take some time to examine your heart, your attitudes, your affections, your desires. If God brings things into your mind that you need to repent of, repent. If God is convicting you of things that you need to do in life, do it. And then whenever you're ready, I'm going to invite you to come, grab the elements from the table, and then you may go back to your seats and we're going to worship Jesus for a little bit. Let's worship God together.